Namaskaram, welcome to P Gurus. I'm your host JK. I would like to begin this program with uh, by thanking Sri TV for providing us with the studio. We've been doing a lot of collaboration already. Uh, so yeah, a big thank you to Mr. Balagotamanji. And then it's been a few times. I, in fact, I remember doing a couple of book review earlier. One was with Major Tripathi ji, and then other one was with Ramesh Shinde ji. That was about Alal uh, Jihad. And today, yet another book review, but the title might stun you, but here it is. It's Brahmin Genocide. In this modern world, I guess we talk about we being in computer world and Brahmin Genocide, you can't even imagine that being happening anytime or any day. But let's discuss this book, review this book, talk to the author himself. I'm really happy to welcome his pen name is Asi, but his actual name being Mahalingam Balaji. I would like to welcome him to the P Guru studio. Namaskaram Swami. Sri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Namaste Gopiji. Namaste to your P Guru's audience. Uh, so Swamiji, first of all, uh, Brahmin genocide. The question being, to begin with, is that even remotely possible? We know there are a lot of Brahmanophobia, Hinduphobia, I guess uh, there is a word called Hindu mystic, Hinduphobia happening around the world. But you're kind of singling out a particular community, Brahmanophobia. So let's start with this genocide because we have seen genocide earlier. I guess people are familiar, uh, the Holocaust, uh, Nazism uh, being much talked about, right? And then uh, a lot of things happen uh, in our own home rather in the backyard we had Kashmir issue <coughs> Chitpavan Brahmins in uh, 1940s 1948 rather after uh, the death of uh, uh, what you call as Mahatma and then uh, we had the other one being the Sikh Riyadh in 1984 and then Brahmin genocide of Kashmir right Pandit uh, Exodus if you have to call that but just coming to this discussion on Brahmin genocide now, do you think that's ever going to happen or genocide in, in the sense? What exactly are you trying to say as genocide? Uh, thank you, Gobiji. I think it's our sincere wish and prayer and I think all our well-wishers of humanity as well as Bharatiya civilization will hope and pray that genocide doesn't happen, not just to Brahmin community, but for any, any individual or for any community for that matter. The key point of writing this book is to create an awareness about a potential genocide like situation and how it needs to be made aware to many, not just in the Brahmin community, but just to the whole uh, Bharatiya civilization and if not global, because any genocide is a global issue, not just the particular community issue. The word genocide has been used after evaluation of facts and careful evaluation of the two and with a sincere application of mind. So that's the factors which we see. There is a worldwide model, a uh, popular model, which has been uh, done by Dr. Stanton, Professor Stanton. He had created an eight-stage model and he has made a ten-stage model, later on made it to ten. And all these stages have a certain characteristics and uh, the stages are uh, not necessarily one after another in a sequential way, though normally they are. But at the same time, uh, it can also happen in an iterative way in the sense that two, three stages can happen in parallel and then it can again go back into a sequence. So, <clears throat> so it's not a very definitive steps as like a steps in a staircase. That's point one. In all these eight to ten steps, what we have done is we have also opened a website called www.braminjunocide.org where people can go and see those stages, what is the characteristic of those stages and what is the situation for the Brahmin community today. So we have mapped that and then we have shown that there is a significant and a correlation between what is happening today to the characteristic. And sometimes I do get asked this question, is it something like what people do call a promotion, some kind of a scare tactic or getting the attention kind of stuff, is that how we came then we kept the name genocide? I answered it by saying that as it is not uh, 
done randomly it is used the model second thing is by creating this website we also shown that it is not just for a uh, commercial or for any other reason people can go and visit this website and then they can read through the basic information if they need additional information then they can obviously go in and then read it in the book okay. now the third point about this is you also summarized about some of the incidences which have happened in india one of the characteristic we see is that uh, in many of the uh, kind of mass killings we can call them for a what of a better term or maybe a genocide or a riots uh, do we have a precise sense of how many people have been impacted uh, i have you know when we look at that uh, the information is not too detailed and uh, it, it kind of uh, creates a uh, situation where a the victims uh, may not be getting the necessary closure for them in terms of uh, what has happened in that uh, particular riot or you know when they might have lost their loved ones or maybe they have disposes their material wealth is spoiled so so many things are there so people are still living with those emotional burden and that is another second thing which we see in the indian context there so we need to kind of uh, look at it and again uh, the last key point is when we talk about this genocide it is not a local phenomena we are talking about we are talking about a global level and it is our view that the brahmin community has been uh, initially targeted by the colonial rulers when they came in thinking that this is the priestly class uh, which is leading people into a uh, different uh, path and then so they for whatever reason they started attacking the brahmin community and later on it continued even in the independent india and that is creating a significant impact because the way it was targeted was initially brahmins were at the edge of knowledge civilization of the bharatiya civilization and hence uh, by targeting brahmin they were trying to target the knowledge traditional knowledge systems of india so that is how the whole history has been and that continues today uh, for people who may not even be pr- uh, practicing brahmin but they still get uh, identified as one and then hence they become part of the civilizational battle that's our argument in the book right the other question that comes to my mind is this anti brahminism or brahmanophobia mm-hmm. at least in southern part of india as we see it could actually bring some political party some votes and they been in power for some time i guess they still going with it right recently not not so uh, uh, long ago we heard one of a legislative member uh, just in social media ranting that uh, we should have done the genocide earlier uh and we see many people are quiet they are not even questioning his intent or not even just uh just pointing out is hatred for a particular community this seems to be kind of normalized all over at least uh the country uh do you feel the same i think it's a, uh, i would put this question with your permission into two three parts a is with the kind of hate which see in the social media and what goes around does it really translate in india into a large scale uh, hatred for brahmins we don't see that uh, that much in the ground and that i think is very thankful to the general public uh, who still are uh, having the bharatiya civilizational values and then they they have this brotherhood and then universal brotherhood wanting to live in peace so we i think we are very thankful to the bharatiya civilization for that uh, even uh, we do have some people coming and telling us that when we did the research that Uh, the programs uh, of uh, anti brahminism or we, we call it brahmophobia right that's how we define it that's the irrational uh, fear of brahmin we have created this term because uh, just to side track on that unless we name a phenomenon we may not be able to kind of work on it and address it because we right. cannot ignore a phenomenon to say it's a random acts so we are called it uh, brahmophobia and we have defined it in our book so we request uh, all the pigro audience and as well as yourself to refer to it as a brahmophobia so when we look at brahmophobia in some parts of india people say that see we do have anti brahmin sentiments but it did not really translate into a large scale violence 
and in some states they even say that you know what our leaders had to go on all india radio and other uh, media at the time of mahatma gandhi's assassination to say that uh, brahmin community should not be uh, targeted in our place so i think it's a, it's a very good uh, thing if they have done that because i think that saved a lot of lives and i think we're really thankful to that but the point is does it mean that there is Uh, some kind of what we call uh, in a powder cake which is there which is being powered in a, and it just needs a spark to ignite and today with social media and fake news and deep fakes and others coming in all it requires is one spark right we don't and then before uh, the community could react or before the leadership could react things can go quickly out of hand so hence we need to make sure that uh there is no environment for such a hatred right? not just for brahmins for any other community hence a lot of our efforts though we say it is towards the brahmin community i think in the longer term it is going to help each and every community especially in a multi uh, ethnic multi religious and uh, you know diversity place like india so we need to learn to make sure that hate speech and others is not just happening not just for one community for everybody it's not it's not just acceptable it should not be i think the keyword used normalized yes it should not be normalized at any cost it should not be seen as a cause and effect phenomena or it should not be justified as some reaction hate speech is a no it's a capital n o that's how it should be right so the other question I w- because that's what you have written in the book in terms of the social media uh, i guess you have named a few people openly thanks for that i guess you have identified people or who are actually spreading this uh, hatred among uh, the fellow citizens uh, the other question is you have, you have spoke you also spoke about the mediums right you spoke about cricket television we know for for reason right for long almost say five decades now or six decades we have seen brahmins have been portrayed as a soft target or uh, being bullied most of the time uh, i guess he seems to be what you call as a geek right so he's a geek who can be targeted who can be bullied uh, and he does not have uh, any problem with that he, they kind of tend to ignore it or neglect and just move on i guess isn't that paving way for a uh, peaceful society why do you want to just make it as an issue now well uh, three things we have research which says that social media hate can really translate into real life violence All right <clears throat> so there are research studies which say that and we have uh, narrated one particular uh, research where Uh, in germany i think uh, they have taken uh, data hand collected data of facebook uh, postings on anti refugee sentiments and whenever this uh, anti refugee sentiments increase in the social media we see that there is a correlation to uh, actual violence which is happening and we also talked about some uh, <coughs> even uh, military manuals which talk about that aggression offline online can lead into real world physical violence so it's not about some casual uh, ranting or venting kind of stuff yes is there uh, a room for that yes because i don't think uh, you know social media can be 100% free of uh, people coming and ranting and others so i don't think that can be really possible to enforce at the same time we need to be wary of uh, uh, attacks which are happening in a significant way and we have shown that in many places where we have taken examples Uh, we have taken care that individuals are not identified so that's for the privacy reason so we are kind of mask that but when it comes to political parties when it comes to uh, say some organizations especially ngos or maybe public personalities we have seen that some few instances we are not just picked one random instance and we also given something called as a brahmophobia test where the, there is a four stage test where people can say hey is it a real uh, brahmophobic content or is it just that uh, somebody is uh, just casually said something we don't uh, say that it's a 100% proof uh, that so we just want to say that at least we can filter it initially to say hey is this looking brahmophobic then we have to go back to that person to say challenge it to say hey it appears brahmophobic can you please explain yourself so at least we need to start asking those questions and then challenging some thought rather than just leaving it as isolated and the last point about it is even in, uh, i think in a place like uh, myanmar facebook has itself said that uh, you know it was used to incite uh, uh, violence so we have to be very wary of social media it's it's got a lot of 
beneficial thing we have also acknowledged that in the book that social media has helped me especially like many small businesses to come and then flourish right and people are able to communicate people are able to be in touch with their loved ones so there are 100 good reasons why social media exists but it also gives a, a little power for uh, people who can go on target uh, others so so we need to make sure that even those uh, what we call as um, <clears throat> elements which are uh, not uh, in uh, rogue elements we can call it or maybe people with the malafide intentions these people should not be allowed to misuse social media so we need to have some governance around that i'm sure the big companies do have that uh, but is it effective especially when it comes to uh, local language or when people start using coded languages to you know use those kind of messages then we need to have uh, it's like always what they call as the cyber security stuff like it's like we had need to be one step ahead of the bad actors so to speak i think i was looking for the word bad actors there so right. the bad actors should be kind of kept away as much as possible right did i answer your question you, you did it certainly did uh, in fact just moving ahead we did see in fact uh, whenever there is a in fact just going back uh, we had a ca bill and then we had foreign actors supporting right anti ca right, being anti ca and they kind of uh, put that in their social media in twitter they kind of supported uh, the anti ca and then same goes with the farmers bill because environmentalists came and supported that it should not be passed in the in 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 in, in the in the, the parliament likewise we also saw somebody who was a high profile ceo of a company coming down to india and holding a placard smash brahmanical patriarchy then we have to ask the question who is kind of behind all this do you have an answer for that do you think uh, that is that is some kind of a common fund or somebody like george soros who is trying to do this have you kind of Uh, highlighted that in the book or at least do we kind of going in the direction where you can get an answer for such questions this is a great question i split i think it's uh, split into three parts uh, uh, if with your permission number one yes uh, we refer to some of the protests which are happening i think india is a vibrant democracy and in this democracy we need to have this kind of voices we may agree or disagree with some of the voices but freedom of expression and speech is enshrined in our constitution so if people are using that i think uh, you know nobody should have any objection as long as it is within the rule of law and within the constitutional means and india has a robust judicial system as well where people can go and take remedies right so these processes are uh, well defined the democratic institution so i think we can kind of leave it to those democratic institutions to so take care so the second point which you mentioned about the smash brahminical patriarchy and the third point is it uh, or or do we know about what is motivating them to do and who is behind that so we won't gone into that part of what is motivating them and who is behind their part there but just taking that smash brahminical patriarchy word the word patriarchy we are trying to kind of highlight how it is used as one of the brahmophobia techniques there are many techniques of brahmophobia one of them is what we call a circular referencing or using somebody's code to somebody's code to somebody's code i'll give you the example here mm, the patriarchy as i think most of your viewers may know is about a male dominated society or are uh, where the males are identified as the dominant one and the uh, the opposite to that will be a uh, matriarchy right where there is a, <coughs> a female uh, in the species holds the power so many anthropologists of the or of the view that uh, in this civilizational history uh, they have not heard of any matriarchal society which do exist i think in indian situation many people say that uh, india has something which is similar to that in kerala some parts of kerala where uh, the <coughs> the women's names are taken into the in the next successive line and other stuff but even that uh, we can't say is 100% matriarchal so having said that why would somebody attribute patriarchy to brahmins right so we did some research and we have documented it in the book this is some seems to have come from a research paper right and the research paper is authored by a, a, a professor and she refers in that paper to a paper by written by another person uh, i think if i remember his name is uh, this is professor noor noor yalman uh, is a professor whom she is referring to and this person's research is based in uh, in a, in a ceylon 
right and so this is sri lanka for uh, for viewers benefit and the characteristic of that society is that brahmins do not exist in that society and even new elman talks about that so this professor who has done coined this term has taken about close to societies and then said okay what is happening in uh, that society can be applied in in to india now very good right but the point is logically speaking there are two close societies uh, which are having very similar characteristic and we find absence of brahmin in one then i would logically say that uh, brahmins are not contributing into that right there's okay. something else which is contributing and in, in fact uh, new realman refers to a ceremony which has been uh, done in uh, kerala okay so this is what it goes and the person who has done i think it's uh, her name is kathleen go if i'm not wrong so uh, Kathleen Go has documented that uh, she has uh, talked about some initiation rites, right? And uh, she herself has documented. We went and checked the research paper, which says that well, she has not witnessed that. First one, right? It is not uh, her personal direct empirical evidence. She has relied on people who told that what is supposed to have happened forty, fifty years back. Right. So that gets documented in one paper, and then this goes into a paper written by another person about Ceylon society, and then some of these characteristics get uh, you know what we call in uh, as kind of fitted into a uh, Indian society. You say that oh, it is Brahminical stuff. Right. So well, uh, this is what we call as a circular logic. So we have to go or trace all the way back, but then we don't find any primary evidence which says that uh, Brahminical patriarchy does exist or. how is it different from any other patriarchy in any other part of the world right so <clears throat> that hopefully answers your question there and and the good point which you are making about is that why is brahminical word being used there and that also we have spoken about as it's a, some kind of a shield being used to say that oh i don't refer to brahmins i refer to something brahminical right so uh, that is something like uh, <clears throat> what we can call as right is kind of a uh, go to solution to say oh we don't refer to brahmins as a community we just refer it to the word brahminical so and is there is no fixed definition for brahminical by the way as you know it right so anybody can call anything brahminical and then it can just grow with the flow right so that's that's how it is so it's when something is so fluid so it is very difficult for people to say that it is brahminical or it is not brahminical and i would love to see uh, anybody saying that a 1 2 3 4 or four steps of it you can say upon something is brahminical or not brahminical right yeah. Sorry, uh, the long answer to oh, that. Oh, that's all fine. Uh, I guess we need to give uh, that kind of response to our audience to understand what we are talking about. This book has been uh, released by our very own patron, uh, Dr. Subramaniam Swami, and then writer Prabhagaranji, and then our Reverend uh, Chandalagaraji Swami. His Holiness. Right? His Holiness. Right. Yes. Uh, So I, I guess they found something very interesting in this book, which I believe uh, that's why they have come to uh, release this book. I guess that happened somewhere in October. Then the, the final question I would like to ask you, because uh, this book needs some value, it had some value because uh, these great eminent personalities have released it. So what exactly are you trying to achieve from this book? What do you believe? would be the take away for you somebody reading this book thank you so <clears throat> we launched this book in july and uh, with ishwara kripa now we are into the second edition of this book and uh, following up our launch i think we are, we are very fortunate to have uh, eminent personality like uh, dr subramaniam swami a thought leader and multifaceted personality and we did have uh, right prabhakar ji who has been a, a thought leader in uh, tamil nadu society and we do have uh, the fortunate of uh, dharmacharya uh, chandalanga ji his holiness we followed it up with another launch in uh, bangalore where we had three sampradayas which is the uh, shri vaishnav sampradaya the uh, advaita sampradaya and we also had the madhva sampradaya so all the three swami ji's uh, anugrahas were there so the second edition which has come out now has the anugraha vachanas of the dharmacharya is there right so we had the blessings for that now what objective we want to create is uh, our objective is to create awareness uh, not just among the brahmin community but across all well wishers of the bharatiya civilization in fact for the whole globe because bharatiya civilization is the only civilization which has has the which can say arguably we can say has the continuity to the 
primordial as we can see because from the time immemorial the Vedas have been propagated or uh, what has been chanted thousands of years back for us we don't name the Vedas as uh, any timeline we don't give any timeline for me it is Amati it has come from the gods so from the time this community has uh, what you go today into a Veda Bhattasala the chanting of the sacred Vedas is what exactly one would, would have been happened thousands and thousands of years back. So this tradition has been preserved. So we have even quoted Professor Jean Limi who has popularly said that right, many, many civilizations built monuments but it is only this civilization which used the power of the mind and you know it went through the human mind, uh, mind like a wave, like a great wave. That's how he has described it, his exact quote. So we have to be proud as the whole world has to be proud of this ancient heritage and it needs to be preserved in fact and that is one. For the Bharatiya civilization it is very important to address this Brahmophobia because Brahmins are being targeted as a colonial legacy and because they were seen as the traditional knowledge carriers. But let's keep in mind uh, this civilization does not belong to one community. It belongs to all the communities. We, that's a whole community. Every community, each and every sub-community makes up the civilization. They transmit the values, the traditions, the practices to the next generation. Hence, if one community is being targeted this way, all it requires is the next community to be targeted by being branded as either Castillas or Brahminical or any of those what I call as the fuzzy terms in the sense that right, they have no fixed definition and can be used very loosely. So then what happens is we see an annihilation. That's how our theme in our book has been that the fun end objective of Brahmin hate speech is annihilation of the Bharatiya civilization and extinction of Hindus. Brahmin just happen to be the way and hence they are being targeted first. So hence we need to make sure that this issue is addressed immediately and we do have see this phenomenon global. Right. So it is not just localized now, you see this kind of a Brahmin hate propaganda happening across the world and many of your viewers might have also experienced it. They may be saying, hey, I, th I thought it is an Indian phenomenon a few decades back, but why is it? Because just realize that wherever you are in the globe, when you took the plane uh, along, I think possibly we can say it in a way that along with it, maybe the cargo compartment, the Brahmophobia also traveled with you unaware. Right? So maybe it is just showing up now, but it was always there in a latent way. We do have an online petition going on just to represent, uh, to make sure that the Brahmin hate speech is addressed. So we do we request all our uh, viewers of uh, P-Gurus, uh, we would encourage them to kind of sign this petition. It's a e-petition and there is no uh, membership or commitment or any other uh, requirement there. We just have to sign this petition with your email address and it's in the www.brahmingenocide.org I request maybe to uh, put, yeah, we'll put it in the description yeah. and so and if people want to know more about what we are going to do uh, uh, they can look at www.saptarishi.com what we are doing there is to create a what we know as the counter narrative because every time we cannot keep reacting to some acquisitions or others about our Bharatiya civilization we need to have what we call as a decolonized uh, our own drishti of the Bharatiya civilization mm -hmm. We are working towards that, so uh, hopefully uh, we are able to succeed in their effort. So uh, that is our key next step. Apart from Brahmin hate speech, is to set up our counter narrative so that we show we know, show the glory of the civilization. Because today, what we hear about Brahmin civilization, Bharatiya civilization. Sorry, I stand corrected. Bharatiya civilization is all about about its uh, supposed issues which we talk about, but uh, we don't see the positives being highlighted of uh, what the civilization has contributed to the globe. So we are working on building the narrative towards that. With Ishwara Krapa, we will we will make progress there. All the best to you on, on all your endeavors, uh, people. So Brahmin genocide is a book, and it has been published by Var Publication. In fact, they also did a great job in uh, publishing one another Dravida Maya, right? Dravida Maya was in Tamil, and then they translated that in into English, and they have published it. So do go read the book, buy it first, obviously. <laughs> so buy it and read it. So it is available. So Brahmin genocide, you can just search online, right? Uh, and it's available as, as a Kindle version, I guess. So right, as a Kindle version, as, as, well. as well is available. Tip, right. Uh, not just physical copy, but I think e-copies are also available. So there you go. You can just buy it and read it and do support is online petition. So we will put it in the description where you have to go. So you just need to click and enter your email address <coughs> so that you can also get associated with this brahmingenocide.org or saptarishi.org. Thank you for watching. We'll come back with more of book reviews or even discussions about books, whichever way you want to call that. So yeah, we're going to be here for long. Thank you very much.
थैंक यू गोपी जी थैंक यू बी गुरु जी